Hello, everyone, and welcome to LabStats Tech Talk. I'm Derek Hershey, Technical Support Specialist here at LabStats, and I'm joined today by a panel of three CIOs from different universities. They're all here to discuss the impact and challenges of COVID-19 from their perspective. In no particular order, we've got Sharon Miller with the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. How are you doing today, Sharon? Very well, thank you. Good, good. And Milos Topic with Grand Valley State University in Michigan. How are you doing, Milos? Doing well. Glad to be here. And Jeff Coiner with Missouri State University. How are you doing, Jeff? Doing great. Thank you. Perfect, perfect. Thank you all for joining us. Hope you're all uh, staying healthy. So we'll be discussing a number of things, mainly focused on the role of IT in the return to campus. There's a huge spectrum in how complete everyone's plan for this is going to be. Uh, so we hope to share a number of ideas, strategies, and lessons learned so far. Uh, to start off, I'd like to ask each of you about the challenges you faced in the spring semester. How has the COVID-19 epidemic impacted your campus and organization? For example, uh, has it had a noticeable effect on the budget or any other portions of campus operation? Milos, I think we'll go ahead and start with you. Yes, so all of the above and then some. It un uncovered a lot of truths. We had two days to switch everyone online. Uh, we obviously focused on teaching and learning first. Mm -hmm. Two days after that, we moved the rest of the university to full remote um, mode, and it's been operating that way now for close to five months. Um, what it did for us, in a degree, to a sense, to a degree, is it really highlighted the value and importance of IT and technology, which perhaps some of my colleagues at that moment, and this was happening at a different university at that time, since I just started my current position, um, they did not necessarily appreciate, did not support um, in some of our funding and strategic allocation conversations in the past. Mm -hmm. And after this, they themselves were the ones pushing forward and saying, we have to make sure that IT has the infrastructure and the support and services and the funding and the staffing that they need for all of us to be successful. So it changed even just the general view of IT and how they are funded and how they're looked at by the rest of the organization. Absolutely changed. Um, they, um, what, what also really helped is we've had overwhelming majority of our community, our faculty, staff, and others, as well as our students who were very understanding and appreciative of their flexibility. And they wanted to roll up their sleeves and be part of the solution. So overwhelming majority of people we worked with um, did their part to help us along or for us to really help them along be successful in their roles. Okay. Sharon, I'd like to share the same question with you. Was there any, anything specific, you know, maybe even anything surprising about how COVID-19 impacted your organization? You're, you know, was there, were there things that came out that, that surprised you or things you guys had to learn along the way this last spring? Yeah, that's a great question. My mind was focusing a lot on what Milo should said, and, and I'm a, I really do appreciate the fact that IT was highlighted and appreciated where um, he was. And um, I think at my university, um, it, we definitely had um, IT was um, necessary in order to um, keep the campus going, to keep teaching and learning going, um, to keep working remote going. Um, and we, we, I think we, we were received a little bit differently, um, similarly to how um, people expect to have power um, and they expect to have plumbing, um, they expected to have IT. Um, and because we went through Hurricane Florence two years ago, we did a mm -hmm. lot of planning um, and, um, and and no, not everything worked perfectly, uh, but the campus, I believe from my, my view is that they expected uh, just IT to be there and the tools to be there. Um, and we didn't get um, as much highlighted as we would have expected. And, and I tend to be the promoter of IT because we do so much behind the scenes um, and we're still working behind the scenes to make everything, everything work. So it's my job to really make sure um, that my staff feel appreciated um, and that the entire organization knows how much work and effort is going in behind the scenes to make things look as seamless um, as they can. And so is that, is that something you guys have been able to achieve then is keep, you know, IT be able to make everything as smooth as possible or have there been any significant jags along the way you've had to work around? Uh, I think we've done an excellent job. Um, and what, what has helped us do such an excellent job is that uh, the campus has embraced uh, or adopted very quickly some of the tools that we had hoped they would embrace, but a bit faster than we expected, such as Microsoft Teams, 
um, Zoom uh, and, and we had fortunately w went live with Canvas as our LMS um, a little over a year ago. So I think we were positioned well and, and our campus community said we're in um, and sure. they jumped on board. So really, really quite good. All right. And Jeff, similar question for you then, you know, what, what were some of the major things that you learned this spring as, as, you know, COVID put a lot of things, you know, put a lot of students at home, put a lot of students remote, put a lot of strain on IT and your network resources. What were some of the things you guys learned? Yeah. So, you know, one, one of the things that, that I've had conversations with other people about to, to, to me, this was like a, it was like a different type of disaster recovery. Right. So we're, we're kind of, used to dealing with systems that may be down or, you know, network connections that are, that are out or whatever those, you know, typical IT disasters that we have to deal with. So we're kind of trained to deal with those things, but this was, Hey, everything was working. We just had to figure out how to make it all available from somewhere off of our campus. And we had good capabilities in some ways to do that. We have, you know, some cloud-based systems that were great for this but we also had some other things that maybe were um, available for students that we had a little bit more of a struggle with to get them access to what they needed to, to be able to continue with their education. So, you know, that, that to me is kind of the way that, that we, we dealt with this um, as a disaster, but a, but a different type of disaster. We were just adding to our workload and trying to make sure that, you know, people that, that needed to take equipment home, we could help them do that. And then whatever they needed when they got home, you know, a lot of people would want to take their desktop computer and everything. I'm just going to take that with me and go home. <laughs> and then they get home and they realize that the wireless network connection doesn't work with my hardwired computer, you know, little things like that. So those were the types of situations that we had to deal with and just kind of help people get through. And, you know, we were fortunate it happened it really hit here around our spring break. So we were able to extend our spring break a week. We had about two weeks to get everybody, you know, I bet the campus. students loved that. <laughs> yeah, they really did. They really did. They, they were willing to extend it, you know, indefinitely. But, but. Well, it raises an interesting point too. You have different levels of, uh, you might say, tech familiarity with different students. Some students can, you know, you say, let's, let's do remote access, for example. And some students go, yeah, that's great. And other students go, remote access, what's this? And so you, you have to be able to, to make that work for all different levels of students, make it as accessible as possible. And not only that, but, but all of them, not everybody's uh, access to the internet is equal, right? That's true. Especially yeah. we, we have rural areas here. We have, we have people that, that just don't have access to the internet for whatever reason, maybe, maybe not even equipment to do that with. So they relied on our computer labs and other things when they were on campus. So now they had to go, go away some of them may have gone home. Some of them still stayed here close, but we still had to try to get them access to those resources. So, you know, we end up buying hotspots and doing all kinds of other things to try to assist those that, that needed that. But, okay. but that was a kind of a totally different challenge. All right. Thank you. And, and to jump to the meat of it a little bit, let's, I know everybody's get, gearing up now trying to get ready for, um, you know, every, all the students returning. Some universities are like, we're going to do online as much as we can. I've talked to other universities that are saying, you know, we're going to, we're, we're just going to bring everybody in. We're going to do the social distancing thing and we're going to try and try and go ahead as best we can with a, as much of a semblance of normal as we can create. There's all sorts of different plans on this. Um, maybe Sharon, I'll start with you on this one. What are kind of the main focuses or the main uh, uh, challenges you're looking at and overcoming as you look at fall semester coming up here in, what are we at, a month now, something like that? Yeah. Um, we were trying to be as uh, um, thoughtful and proactive as we possibly could in order to try to accommodate as much of a face-to-face -face semester as we possibly could, um, as well as be ready to pivot at any point in time um, to be fully online and fully remote. So a um, lot of people doing a lot of work to try to make sure that we have all of our scenarios covered as best as possible. Um, and we're, we're still, you know, August 14th is, is a due date for me for, for bringing plenty of classrooms to up to um, a distance education type room so that we can pivot. Um, we're talking about labs and how do you um, for the students who are going to come in and be face-to-face -face in the lab um, is how do we keep them socially distant in there 
um, without having to move every piece of furniture, chair, computer out of there. I mean, there's so much logistically involved. Um, and then at the same time, we're trying to take those lab applications and make them available, as Jeff was saying, in a remote environment so that if a student is remote um, and is challenged in any way that they can have access to the same applications that they would have if they were physically on campus. So, um, so a quick question, really if you don't, oh, sorry, didn't mean no to problem. cut you off there. Quick question, if you don't mind, um, you said you're trying to, to facilitate a face-to-face -face campus as much as possible. Is this mm -hmm. kind of being left up to student choice as to whether they want to go to campus or work, rem or, or work remote, or are you guys trying to have more control over who is where, when, um, how, how are you coordinating that, I guess, is my question. That's, I give major, major kudos to our space planner on campus, our registrar, um, academic affairs. When it came time to try to rearrange that, that student schedules, um, they did that as best as they could. Um, also with faculty input as to which faculty could come back to campus um, and which needed to move online. Um, and then ultimately the student could view their schedule and make adjustments as needed. Say, say by chance we wouldn't know every student schedule where uh, four classes went online and one was face to face. So now we're going to okay. work with that student to try to turn the last one into an online if that's their choice. Okay. Um, it was a ton, a ton of work, um, and people are still working on it. All right, and uh, Jeff, how about you? Uh, what does next semester look like? What are you guys doing to prep for all the students? I know you you have students on campus as well, right? Yeah, we do. Uh, they started moving in uh, this past weekend, and uh, we'll do that for the remainder of this week. So we, we definitely are having, you know, as many uh, seated classes uh, as we can, but we've offered flexibility there uh, for, for faculty and students both to, to kind of, you know, work through what makes sense for each class. Uh, we we've also are going to require uh, masks in, in our buildings, you know, again, to help and social distancing and, and those things uh, will be important. Uh, and then um, we also, for the first time, waived a residency requirement for our first time freshmen. Oh. There's about a hundred, uh, about a hundred or so of them so far that have decided to uh, take advantage of that. All right. All right. And then Milos, your guys' next semester, I know you guys have students coming soon. Uh, what does your ramp up coming into this semester look like? Much of the same, uh, based on what my colleagues have already shared. It's all about reducing friction and being flexible um, for students, their families, our faculty. You have different folks um, in different uh, risk groups and risk, risk categories, and you have folks with different familiarity and comfort with different technologies and tools that we have uh, deployed across the enterprise. So it's all about finding a way to have as many students and faculty and, and staff on campus as safely possible with all the distancing measures and plexiglass and masks and you know um, sanitizing stations all over the place and so forth. Uh, we also have multiple contingency plans in place. Some are being reviewed right now. Should we need to pull back entirely remotely at some point in the fall, how would that play out? Yeah, and, and you know, that's a very real possibility. You know, we have no idea how things are going to spread or how things are going to look, you know, a month, two months into the semester. So yep. you mentioned, uh, and I think we'll jump over to Jeff on this one. You mentioned, Milos had just mentioned, you know, there's a bunch of different risk groups. There's a bunch of different factors. You've got a hundred different departments all trying to come up with, you know, what does, what does social distancing look like for them? How does this work? How does that work? What do these people want? What do, what do the faculty need? What do the students need? How do you manage everyone's input? I mean, you have, you, you have all these different people trying to, you know, cooks in the kitchen, you might say, how do you manage them and get them all to work together rather than pushing back and forth? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, a lot of communication. Uh, and, and, and I think somebody already mentioned, you know, flexibility has it, got to be key in this situation because, you know, the, the things change so quickly. Uh, it, it can change over the weekend. It can change, you know, from one day to the next uh, based on, on what's going on with the situation. So, you know, I think, you know, the, the main thing that we've done, we have a team of people uh, that are working together and have been since March meeting uh, regularly, uh, sometimes multiple times a week, just to work through situations. Uh, we, we also activated a, a COVID response team that can deal with specific uh, situations, whether it's a faculty member or staff member or a student 
you know, if, if they're if they have a particular situation that's unique to them, they can contact this group and and kind of work through that and, and determine the best steps forward. So I think all of those things, really, the, the bottom line is just making sure that everybody that needs to be in the loop is in the loop. Did you have any friction through all of these processes, or was it a pretty a pretty seamless transition into you know this this task force and the, and the the setup that you guys had? You know, I think the task force has worked really well together. Probably, you know, the the friction I think has come more from um, just that constant change. So mm -hmm. you know, you, you you decide kind of make make a decision one week, something happens over the weekend that that kind of shifts the direction, and you you have to rethink the decisions that you made. So. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily call it friction as much as as much as just some, um, you know, continuing discussions on on how we have to handle those situations. All right, and and Milos, how about you guys? You guys, you know, like I said to Jeff, you have a hundred different people with a hundred different ideas on how to handle this. How do you coordinate all that? Did you do something similar to what what Jeff was talking about, or did you guys have a different way to approach it? I'm to it. Um, you and take everybody's input, but no matter what you do, there's going to be a percentage of people who disagree with you, which is kind of part of leadership. It is important to make decisions. And one of the comments that Sharon made earlier is make the best decision with the information you have available at that time and be humble enough to realize that if a month from now your decision was incorrect, to correct the course, pivot, adjust, and move forward. We welcome everybody's input, we take everybody's input, but there's just no way to incorporate everybody's input because you're gonna have a number of folks who say, I wanna be in my office or in my classroom, and you have others who are saying, I don't wanna be there, and then you have students who are saying the same, and it's just physically impossible to make sure that everybody's needs are attended to 100% of the time. All right, and, and Sharon, I know you mentioned uh, you guys had IT very, very closely involved with a lot of this setup. How was that coordinated? You know, how, how did, I, I believe you and I talking beforehand, you had talked about a, a COVID, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, like a, a committee kind of a thing you guys had going, right? Yes, we had, um, very similar to Jeff, where we had a task force um, and work groups. And I was fortunate to serve on three out of the eight work groups. And um, within the work groups, I was exposed to a lot of the questions and a lot of the concerns um, and try to understand how technology could alleviate some of them. So reducing our touch points um, by uh, students not having to walk forms around or visit several offices. Um, what could we do? And we, we ended up uh, adopting an e-form and e-signature tool. And um, by being a part of the conversation and, and hearing the critical impact a technology would have um, and able to deliver that information up, we were able to get the funding. Uh, and people had to work really hard to get some of those things in place. Um, yeah. And, uh, and the, other, the other common phrase on our campus, um, thanks to Dr. Charlie Hardy here, is uh, we're building the plane while we're flying it. And, we do have to pivot and we do have to make adjustments and we do have to give each other grace. So I think that um, that's really helped everyone understand um, how fluid this is. All right. Um, what do you think the new normal is going to look like on campus? Do you guys have any indication on, I, I will probably start with, with Sharon here. Do you guys have any idea on how many students are going to be on campus? How many students are going to be remote? Do you have any indication yet of what campus looks like in a few weeks? Well, our numbers are pretty good um, and, and our dorms are, are, are pretty full, um, which I think students really do want to have the campus experience. Um, so what we're doing is trying to make it be as normal as possible mm -hmm. um, and really getting the message out there that if you do adhere to social distancing and wear the mask, we believe that we can have as full a semester um, as possible. Um, so that is the new normal. Um, so you guys are going to be pushing pretty hard then for the social distancing, the masks, the the proper self-care and all those things that, that they need to be, you know, I, I mean, obviously that's important, but sounds like that's pretty integral to your guys's plan. It is. It really is. Okay, and, and Jeff, uh, your normal, does it look similar to Sharon's? Do you have maybe uh, more students going to be off campus or more on? What are, what are you seeing coming your way? Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's similar. I think, you know, it's, it's relatively um, normal numbers, I think, that will be on campus. 
Um, the, the enrollment we had actually planned, I think across the country, we were looking for lower enrollment, I think in, in university. So everybody's kind of fighting for those students, but, mm -hmm. but we were pleasantly surprised. We actually had more students enroll and coming on campus than we anticipated even before COVID. So, um, I, I really? think they want that. Yeah. I think they want that experience. You know, the, the, the kids, I think, especially that are coming in as freshmen, uh, kind of got kind of got the shaft their senior year because a lot of them <laughs> didn't get to do prom they didn't get to do graduate they didn't get those experiences and i think they they are frustrated but i actually have a niece that is in that situation that's coming to the university and and, and uh then i also have my my youngest son is graduating this year so i've kind of got both ends of the spectrum uh, in, in my family that that kind of talking to both of them to get their perspectives on this too but but uh, I, I think they want that experience, so we're trying to provide it for them. And but but I think they also learn that that they're going to have to adapt, and and they may have some of those things kind of shift, you know, this year. And they'll probably be more flexible about it now because of what they've been through. Here, our our K through 12 school system has made some decisions on how they're delivering classes, and and they've gone to a a two day kind of alternating schedule. So that impacted, you know, our, some of many of our employees, uh, and and what they needed to do personally, you know, to manage that. So, so we, again, kind of switch gears based on those decisions, to allow a little bit more flexibility for faculty to, you know, possibly do the same thing. Maybe maybe have more of a hybrid type class situation where, you know, you have you have a, a couple of days where you're in in the office and a couple more where you're teaching virtually. So. Uh, you know, that's certainly been one of the things that, that we've had to adjust and uh, continue to make decisions like that. All right. And, and Sharon, your guys' your guys is normal, you know, your changes that are coming up. What are some of the, the, the other major changes you've had to make going forward here? Well, some of the major changes are, you know, very similar to everyone else. I think that um, that what we've done to prepare for those was we have our um, distance education and e-learning um, group and we have our center for teaching and excellence that put on an expo where about 2,000 um, faculty members went through um, in case we have to pivot so i think so much of it is planning um, just to make sure we're ready for all the different scenarios and um, i think that overall the university has done a very good job of trying to talk all that through and figure out how to make those accommodations and when we talk about employees um, they've really been very resilient and, and so productive. Um, and I'm wondering what our workforce and, and on-campus presence looks like going forward, you know, for, for the forever future, um, because it's worked really, really well. Okay, so, so maybe even some, maybe when COVID blows over a little while from now, you, who, who knows when that's going to be, but you guys might be doing things different permanently uh, for, for me from here on out. I would say it's a possibility. Interesting, interesting. Uh, and Milos, for you guys, uh, your new normal, you're, you're getting things set up, you got people there. What does the plan look like um, going forward? What, what kind of other changes have you made? Just a quick comment. I'm, I'm not a fan of that new normal term because there's nothing normal about people being <laughs> that's true. Or, that you're, that's or, true. Or, that's or living true. through a pandemic. Um, we're social creatures. We're social beings. You want that interaction. You want that body language, that smile, that at one point where we could, that friendly handshake or a pat on your back. Yes. So I hope it's a temporary diversion uh, or a detour on our path to growth as, as a community and, and as a society. But until that time, happier time comes along. Um, we are really focused on, on collaboration and, and reducing barriers. And I've said this earlier, reducing friction and giving people flexibility and providing them different online capabilities and extending that digital education and meeting them where they are. We're moving away from that old traditional model, which I mean, still carries weight and value in, in some disciplines more than others. But we're 50 or 70 or 80 people in an auditorium, all drove from 50, 70, 80 different locations to campus, fought to find parking spots to then come in to watch someone write on a chalkboard or a whiteboard. There are other things where 
students can self-pace their knowledge acquisition and then maybe once they're face to face with their professors really then expand and unpack those ideas and challenge their notions of learning and previously uh, predetermined thoughts and preconceived notions so we're trying to reimagine the the um, and supplement and augment online learning and education in a different way from just simply saying we're going to put a bunch of pdfs online and call it a day so we're investing a lot in training and a lot in bringing everybody's comfort level to that new platform. And the interesting thing to me about that is, you know, today's generation of students are very comfortable online. They're used to being online. They're, you know, it, that's, that's a normal part of their everyday life. It kind of plays into that really well, I think. Absolutely. I think it's really important for higher education to um, be mindful of the market shifts and demands because they are changing. And those uh, universities that are not paying attention and not responding and pivoting quickly enough may be left behind. Okay. And uh, we'll start, start with Jeff on the next one, I suppose. What advice or direction, if you had any, would you give to a campus IT leader who's trying to figure out or trying to work through an action plan for the fall? Given hindsight and what you've seen and how you've gone through things, what would you, what would you offer as advice? Uh, I think probably two things, you know, you've got to have the best team environment that you have to work through these situations. And, and, you know, most of us are very fortunate. And I know I am when it comes to that. I've been at, I've been at Missouri state for just over a year and I came from the city before that. So, but I think those partnerships, you know, internally with my own team and, and how well they work together externally with our customers and the people that we support in the university and then also with um, with those uh, vendor partnerships are important as well to make sure that you know you're, you're kind of communicating and and helping everything across across the board, and, and I think that's the that's the key, and that's the key for just IT in general, right? Is is those partnerships and and just being available to to help work through situations with with everybody that we have to support. All right, and share an advice from you for an IT leader who's trying to figure out, you know, where to go from here. What's the plan for fall? Um, what have you learned? What would you share? I think it would be exactly what I said earlier, which is to trust your expertise and the knowledge and the information that you have at the time and make a decision. Um, because we find ourselves sometimes at a loss if we wait till we have all of the information. You'll find that there is a shortage of supplies. You'll find that uh, the that the demand is already here. Um, that you you need a service from a vendor and they're already booked up. So, I think that you really need to be able to make a decision and move forward. And like Milos had mentioned, you know, adjust course if you need to. All right, and Milos, same kind of thing from you. If you had any piece of advice you could give to an IT leader working on their own plan. What is it you would tell them? Uh, be prepared for the unexpected as well as one could be. Um, and don't take it personally. Sometimes you and your teams will spend weeks or months planning, investing, and, and testing and troubleshooting a particular solution. And that might end up being thrown out the window for a valid reason. So um, always focus on the gr things that are gr uh, in service of greater good above individual goals and career next steps and always be in service of your community and then everything else that comes your way after that will be well earned all right and uh milos let's jump to you let's jump to you on this what do you think a cio can best do to support students going forward listen get actually actively engaged in um, different organizations across campus, uh, meet with student senate and others, others, and really hear from them. Don't assume because you may have kids who are college age um, or a few years before or after that age, whatever that age is today, because that keeps shifting and changing as well, or because you yourself have gone through a college experience at some point in the past. Listen to what their needs are, actively engage them in advisory groups and bodies, and, and get input directly from them. Um, and then obviously work um, across your networks, the way I worked with Sharon and, and others in the past, um, to listen to and learn what their campuses 
are experiencing and focused on because often you'll, you'll start to recognize patterns and you'll see synergies that are not just focused to your campus or your university, but could be across the state, across the region, or across the entire country. All right, and Jeff, what is it that you would say CIOs can best do to support their students going forward? You know, I agree with uh, Milos as far as listening and just paying attention to, to what's going on. You know, we, we had uh, several town halls. We had one of those with students. Um, and, and a lot of them, even though they're more comfortable with online, and certainly uh, my generation was at the time, I, I think that they still want that college experience, right? They still would like to be in class for, yeah. for at least part of this. They want to they want to have that that experience and be on campus. So I think you know we've got to find ways uh, that we can um, deliver the classes that they need in an environment that they that they want to to be in. So you know that, I think that's really important for us to to be cognizant of that. Okay, and Sharon, what have you found you can do best to support students? As Jeff was saying, <laughs> he has a niece and a, and a son, I believe, or a daughter. Right. Right. Yeah. And, uh, son, my son was a senior in high school last year and missed all those things and yeah. graduated UNCW last year and missed out on her <laughs> graduation. So I think that I would try to, um, from the mom side and, and a bit <laughs> the CIO side is to, to tell them that, uh, they need to, they need to take a break. They need to get outside. They need to breathe. Um, they need to give themselves some time and some grace because this is an unprecedented um, situation that they find themselves in. Um, and if they need help, they should reach out to anyone at the university, uh, family and friends to get that support that they need. Because I feel like that brick wall is just right in front of them all the time now. Instead, you used to get to it October, November, December timeframe where they are guessing out. Um, and now it could come a lot sooner. So I just want to make sure that they take that time for themselves um, in order to be successful and that we are all here however we possibly can to help. Yeah, and I, I think that that probably goes very well for, you know, just, just as well for IT professionals too, is that, you know, stop and take a step back for a second, take a breath, go for a walk, you know, COVID is like this, this big, like you said, it's this big brick wall and it can get overwhelming if you don't try and keep things in perspective as best you can. Uh, Jeff, what, what would you say about, you know, something that, what do you think CIOs can best do to support students and their campuses going forward as, as you know, we're, we're facing this? Yeah, man, Sharon nailed it too on, the, on that, because I, I think that's something that gets overlooked sometimes. You're always kind of focused on the technology or the, those, those types of things, but, but really, you know, regardless of the, of the disaster that we have to work through, it's the people that make that work. And, and if, if we can't um, be mindful of how they're doing in the situation, uh, we, we, could, we could get in, in bigger trouble than, than, than the pandemic, right? Because there's, there's just certain things that we're not going, going to be able to respond to. I had, I had a, in, a, in a, my, my career at the city before I came here, we had a, a really bad uh, virus outbreak. And, and during that whole recovery process. One of the ladies that, that worked for me that I literally thought was the toughest person that I'd ever met um, was in tears over this, this situation that we were in and just trying to, you know, emotionally handle that. And I think that taught me a lesson. It's like, man, if that can happen to her, <laughs> it can happen to any of us, you know? So, I, but I think, I think that's, that's been something that since we've started this and everybody went to work remotely, we've tried to be um, conscious about staying in touch with everybody and just saying, Hey, how are you doing? How's your family? You know, th those types of things, because that's, that's absolutely critical. And, and I think you're right from a student perspective. Um, they've had to go through a lot and, and they're probably going to be more resilient from it at some point in time when they, when they're able to look back, but right now it's got to be very difficult for them. So we need to make sure that, yeah, we, we, you know, understand that they may, may be upset about certain situations that they're in um, that might not normally upset them. And we need to kind of, you know, show them some grace and, and, and help them along. And, and our president does a great job of, of reminding us about that as well. Jump over maybe Milos, do you have anything that you guys are still working on that you haven't quite nailed down? Contact tracing. Um, uh, I see. Uh, we have reviewed many applications and many self-proclaimed solutions. Um, I found a few that I think have 
a promise uh, of potential, but I am not necessarily sold on any of them being the silver bullet. Um, and I think it creates other logistical, legal, and, and larger societal issues if each campus does their own thing separately, because members of our community live um, outside the confines of our campuses. So they go to other locations, other towns, other parts of the city or the state or the country. And um, until we have a, a centralized, either across the state or across the region, or ideally across the nation solution, um, all of these are way too fragmented to make sense and to produce valuable data. Also, when it comes to adoption, you need at least 60% of users using it for data to make any sense. Well, and everybody's got, you know, different ideas of what they want to share and what they don't and how they want to be contacted or how they don't anyways. Correct. Correct. And privacy itself has a lot of considerations that I think we've put in the back burner um, in service of action and speed, but it ne it's a conversation that needs to be had at the highest levels. I would agree with that. Uh, Sharon, how about you guys? Is there anything, any issue you're trying to solve that you haven't yet managed to hit the nail on the head on yet? Well, I would say we have hit the nail on the head um, and we want uh. to expand it. So what I'm talking about is um, having a virtual desktop um, experience so that students can from anywhere access the applications that they normally would have to visit a lab for. And um, we had a, um, an on-campus installation of this and it definitely helped us throughout the spring semester and we see uh, demand increasing. So we've, we ordered an expansion for that. And um, now is the time where we need to decide, do we expand our current environment and that we can do pretty quickly or do we wait a little bit extra um, and put that out in a co-location somewhere so that it's off premise. Um, and part of the reason for that is we, um, you know, we just had a really bad storm last week. We did have Hurricane Florence here. So mm. um, we are very um, aware that it's possible that you know, September could bring a storm that takes us down um, the campus offline for a while. Um, so right now, I think we're, we're in the midst of weighing the options of, do we have enough time to get it off premise or do we need to just expand our physical presence here? Um, and those are just decisions that we're making as they come up because we were waiting for the equipment to be delivered. So there's only so much planning you can do um, yeah. until it gets here and then uh, make the decision. And I know there's some schools that are looking at virtualization, like you've been talking about. Other schools have been looking at remote desktop type things, you know, utilizing the already existing hardware there on your campus remotely. Is that something you guys have looked into? Um, I'd, I'd much rather um, do a virtual desktop mm -hmm. um, implementation than have remoting into um, to current desktops. That's something I'm actually actively working away from. Um, this way, when you say, because of our location and of, for other reasons, I think it's it's important to set up the virtual infrastructure so that it works from anywhere and doesn't depend on this physical campus. Uh, like in the like in the case of storms you were just talking about, you know, any kind of outage then puts all of your uh, uh, your your remote desktops and stuff out it of commission for for a while. Okay. Yes, yes, it does. All right, so Sharon, we'll jump to you from ten thousand feet up. Let's just do super high level here. What are you kind of most concerned? as an IT leader in higher education right now? Are there any, any, any brewing changes? I mean, we got this COVID thing. Is, is there anything that, that you are really focused on coming up in the future? Well, that's a great question. Um, the first thing that comes to mind, and I want to set myself up for a target for it, is <laughs> really, you know, of course, it's information security, um, yes. data governance, IT governance. There's just so much that I think, um, we as a university need to make sure that we're doing in concert so that we have the best result that I think that strategically we're having very good conversations about data and security and governance. Um, although you, you might not think that those are top of mind right now, they're very, very necessary. Yeah, well, especially as anyone's, as everyone's focused on other things, that suddenly becomes, you know, a, an avenue that you have to pay more attention to, even as you want to focus somewhere else. Yeah. Um, Jeff, how about you? You know, 10,000 feet up, what are you, what are you concerned about going forward? So we've talked about, you know, security is obviously going to be top of mind for anyone in these, you know, with this kind of thing. Is there, is that kind of where your focus is in some cases, or are you looking at other things as well? 
Yeah, I, th I think in some cases, I think a couple of things there really, you know, funding uh, ongoing, what the budget looks like, you know, for the next year and beyond that. I think that's that'll be a concern and, and what happens at, at the state level, you know, for us for, for, for that. But uh, the other thing just for, for my staff is being able to, you know, continue su to support all of the the computer systems and, and equipment that we have on campus while still be being able to uh, support those people that are now working remotely. I think that's a challenge, you know, there, there are different types of support, there are different um, problems that, that come up, you know, off campus and on yeah. campus. So, so I think that's, that's a concern there that, that we're going to be able to with our current, you know, quantity of staff that we have, be able to, to manage both of those well. All right, and Milos, your 10,000 foot view, what are you paying attention to on the horizon? Talent. Um, I agree with all the things that my colleagues have said, security and, and, and funding and priorities and strategic placement of technology and how that changes and ebbs and flows with different administrations and different priorities. Yeah. But ahead of it all, I would place talent uh, because I believe having the right people and right leaders and right roles uh, greatly impacts and influence your final outcome. Um, everything else is secondary. I can have all the tools, bells and whistles. If you know, I don't have the right leaders leading those areas and those departments, my upside will always be limited. Okay. And let's jump, let's jump over to Jeff on this. Uh, I've, I was reading on, I've been, you know, as I've been researching all this COVID, you know, COVID-19 and learning about things, one comment I saw that really stuck out at me was uh, pandemics typically are, aren't measured in weeks. They're measured in months or even years. Uh, what do you see long-term plans with COVID, long-term plans with your school, your campus? Are you guys looking out that far at this point, or are you still focused on just the fall semester? I think right now we're focused on the fall semester, but we recognize that we can't continue to do that. We have to start looking out more, you know, at, at, at that longer term and, and what's going to happen. But you know, things, things have been coming at us so, so quickly and, and like we've, we've all talked about changing so quickly, it's, it's difficult to, to kind of look, look beyond that. But certainly, I don't think anybody believes that, that this is going to go away, you know, just this in the fall semester. I think we'll be dealing with this for a long time. So, so you know, just structurally, I think we have to continue to, to carry on with the, with the teams and the response uh, plans that we have and, and recognize our contingency plans and just keep revisiting those um, as often as we as we can while continuing to try to operate. Okay, and Milos, your guys' long-term plans, months, years in advance, are you thinking that far ahead or are we mainly just kind of in a let's get fall semester done and see what happens kind of a mode? Um, we're... we're huh. It's a great question. Um, <laughs> There's we, a lot are, going on. <laughs> we are, I mean, I think my hesitation and my answer already gave you the answer. Um, we are trying to think ahead and that's, you know, part of my job and my responsibilities to be one of those folks on campus who thinks ahead, mm -hmm. but you cannot um, stay away from immediate challenges that are right in front of you or that you might be right in the middle of. So uh, a lot of it is focused on the fall in spring, we do try to carve off some time um, at times to look beyond that and, and position accordingly so that when now those big shifts come in a year or two or three that we're prepared, but overwhelming majority of, of our time is actually focused on over the next six months. Well, and like you said, you know, you're, you're kind of just coming into this university, right, from another position, another university, but you're, you're fairly new in the environment now that you're trying to set up. Yeah, and which is which is both good and and, and less than ideal. <laughs> but <laughs> but but uh, I'm I'm taking it. I'm staying on the positive perspective inside, and I'm trying to leverage my honeymoon for as long as it will last to go around and and you know ask all the right questions, hopefully, and meet all the right people, and hopefully maybe start planting some seeds of change where I believe they're needed. All right, all right, and Sharon. Long-term plan, months or years, obviously, you know, everybody's focused on the fall semester, but what are you guys thinking further out? I think we're doing the same um, as my colleagues have said, where we're, we're, we're focusing on the immediate needs. And I think some of the good things that we're doing is that we're, we're kind of doing a lessons learned 
almost weekly. You know, what, yeah. what, what came up? What are we learning? And how can that best position us for a future that's kind of unknown right now? So um, I think everybody's doing a very good job in trying to keep it all in perspective. Um, and will we be ready? We'll be ready to the best of our ability and we're going to keep planning and keep pivoting um, as needed. I mean, it's, it's really hard to say what's, what we will need a year from now, but we can be better based on what we're doing now. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing I'm, I'm, the biggest thing I'm seeing from all three of you now, I've said it in different terms is be flexible. Every, you know, it's constantly changing. There's constantly going to be new information coming. The CDC multiple times now has changed, you know, when is the, you know, the, the safe period for, you know, uh, quarantine and whatnot. That information is all over the last few, you know, the, the number of months we've been dealing with this. Information keeps changing. So that's my biggest takeaway that I'm getting from you guys is being flexible. All right. Thank you all very much for, uh, for joining me and, and discussing all this. It's going to be uh, greatly informative for everybody who's viewing, and it's been greatly informative for me, certainly. So I really appreciate you guys taking time out of your day. Thanks, Milosa and Sharon and Jeff for, for joining us. Thank you all. Thank you. Yes, thank you.